Hello, my ambition of talking to 21 Paralympians during lockdown continues today with an Australian, but it's an Aussie who lives in the Czech Republic. He has five Paralympic golds and a silver to his name as a sprinter. He's retired twice, but is now back training for Tokyo, as well as possibly even a bash at the Winter Olympics, yes, the Olympics of Beijing 2022. It's Evan O'Hanlon. So Evan, you're, you're always a man who specialises in facial hair and I see that you've, uh, you've got a cracker there again for lockdown. Good to see. Yeah, I quickly did it up this morning for you. Otherwise, most of the lockdown time has been spent with it all over the place and in my nose and my mouth because I haven't been putting it in shape every morning. <laughs> so explain where you are, who you're with and why you're so far away from Australia. Yeah, so uh, I live in the Czech Republic. Um, more accurately, I live in uh, Bashka, which is a really tiny little village uh, about 20 minutes outside Ostrava. Mm -hmm. So if anyone knows Ostrava, it's 20 minutes outside there. And it's basically, I don't know, I'm not sure of the population, but like, it not big. <laughs> I can walk around the whole village in about probably an hour. And yeah. love has taken you there, hasn't it? Yeah, so I'm, I'm over here with, um, I'm living here with my wife and my two children because uh, we were living in Australia, my wife and I, then we had my first daughter and I went to Commonwealth Games, which was the second time that I was supposed to retire. <laughs> I was supposed to retire after Rio and I kept going because of Commonwealth Games. And then after Commonwealth Games, I was supposed to retire, but I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do work-wise and I wasn't enjoying what I was doing that much. Um, when I was doing it part time as a landscape architect, so um, I got this crazy idea to do bobsled and move to the other side of the world with my family. And your um, wife my is... wife is from this village. I didn't just pick a random village in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah, I had images of you sort of like looking at a big map and just putting a pin down. But your wife is a, is an athlete, a Czech athlete, did not she? Yeah, she went to the Olympics in Beijing. She was a twenty kilometer race walker, and then she qualified again for London and injured herself a couple of months out and had to prove her fitness and re, like basically requalify for the Czech team. And, they, and she, didn't, she didn't manage to do it because she kept coming back too early and um, tearing her hamstring again. Uh, so uh, she, after that, she just um, retired from sport and moved to Australia to live with me. And what has lockdown been like in the Czech Republic and, and maybe how, how does it compare to what you're hearing from family back in Australia? Yeah, everyone keeps, when I'm getting on the phone and stuff, they're saying, how are you dealing with lockdown and all of this? But for for us, it's really not that big a deal because we've got two small kids. Um, Ursula is just over two years old and Alfred was born um, three days before lockdown started. So uh, I wasn't allowed to visit the hospital when... So I was there for the birth and then straight away after the birth, I had to leave. And I wasn't allowed to come back for five days while they just kept them there, um, kind of quarantining them for as long as possible with a newborn baby. And then I was allowed to pick them up, but I had to wait outside the door. So um, pretty full on there. And then, yeah, so quarantine started and uh, yes, I, can't go, I couldn't go to the gym. I, I can go starting last week. I can go to the gym here. Um, so that's a big deal, but I hadn't been able to go to the gym like every other athlete and I'm not complaining about it. Like I, I think it's funny when all the athletes get on and complain about not being able to go to the gym or the track. And it's like, there is worse things in the world than not being able to train. Like people are in much worse situations than you. So just get through what you can. Um, I, we're allowed to go outside with the whole time we've been allowed to go out um, for walking and exercising. We were supposed to wear a mask or it's, it's law to wear a mask in public. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was training in the park nearby. We have a, like, I don't know, gym park, you know, like the, yeah, just the, right, yeah. the, metal, the metal bars and bits of timber and stuff. Um, and I managed to get really good sessions done there with, um, with rubber bands and uh, bits and pieces that I bought online, just cheap pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. And I was really happy with that, actually. I, I got back into the gym this week and I felt really strong so i'm really happy with that and then the track uh was closed for a for a while but it's it's uh open again now and we're allowed to train there without a mask on and your family are okay back in australia 
I hope so. No, no, they are, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you come from a sporting family, don't you? It's quite a, quite a pedigree you come from. Yeah, yeah. My mum uh, was a rower and uh, just under national level, basically, like representative level, basically. Um, and then my dad was a coxswain for rowing and he competed for Australia. Uh, my sister uh, was world university champion in the single skull. I've got five sisters though, so chances are someone is going to be <laughs> something in that, in that number. And my uncle was also um, the first Australian to get a gold medal in sailing at the Olympics. He was on the crew. So. And you've never fancy going on the water yourself? I did sail when I was young. I re- I'd sailed in Sydney Harbour. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in the water with the boat upside down with me and my mate swimming around trying to get it back up. And I honestly, I, look, I go back there now and I look at it and I'm like, how was I not scared to be in the water? <laughs> <laughs> I think with age you get um, a little bit smarter and you realise that there is sharks in there. I mean, given that you've retired from athletics twice and now you're looking sort of at bobsled, you've not, you, you've not looked at rowing? We're not going to see you pop up in a few years' time at Paralympics in rowing? I don't think so. I rowed at school um, and technically I can row, like uh, the, the fundamentals of rowing, <laughs> but my energy system is designed much better for the 11 seconds of 100 meter running and not the seven, eight, nine minutes of getting down a two kilometer course. <laughs> now, I, I think we can tell you're a proud Aussie with the, with the top on there. And I'm pretty yeah. sure that's some spread in the background, isn't it? That's uh, from home. Yeah, that's, that? that's Vegemite. Yeah, I just I so. because it's much better than Marmite. <laughs> so I think we can tell where you're from, but you are one of Australia's top Paralympians of all time. Six Paralympic medals, multiple world titles and, and that Commonwealth gold you mentioned um, on the Gold Coast, how special was that winning in your own country? Yeah, that was really nice to have a home games. What was really special for the Commonwealth Games is that it's uh, a joint uh, event between Paralympic and Olympic athletes. So a lot of the guys I trained with anyway, right? Like I was on the track with them, in the gym with them from different sports, athletics, everything. And I know a lot of them. And it was just really nice to be on a team where I got to hang out with the likes of Ben Harradine, who's the Australian discus record holder and uh, like guys that I really respected from outside of Paralympic sport. And I got to be on a team with them. That was, that was really cool. And to compete at home was obviously great. And you've mentioned you've, you've retired twice. What, what is it? Okay. The Gold Coast was the thing that kept, made you come back after Rio, but after the Gold Coast, was it, what, what is it that's kind of brought you back again now? How do you keep the desire for, for training and fitness and diet and everything yeah. like that. I'm going to be honest and say mostly as bobsled. <laughs> um, I was training for the Commonwealth Games and working for my parents in Sydney with my dad. Um, I was with him basically every day in the office and my eldest sister also is a director at the office. And then my sister just below me um, was the uh, office, office manager as well. So it's like a really big family affair. Um, and I was training basically up until 12 or one o'clock every day. I'd do one and a half sessions kind of, you know, squeeze everything in. And then I would go to work for the rest of the day. And I was the worst employee you could ever ask for. I would literally turn up late and leave early because I just couldn't handle it after being on the track for so many years where I got to be outside. And then also like the, the athletics track track is you know you put the work in you get the results and you see it and you can feel it every day you can see that you're putting in hard work you've got a big goal that you're aiming towards it's one single goal whereas at work I think I really struggled because multiple jobs going on at the same time in an architectural firm and jumping between them and you never really get to see anything finished whereas you know not on a day-to-day basis anyway whereas in athletics I get a session written down on paper I go out I finish it. I feel like I've finished it because I feel terrible. And then, you know, I, I feel like I've achieved something that day. Whereas I think maybe in the office, I was a little bit lost in sense of achievement and I really wasn't enjoying it that much. And one day my dad, uh, well, first of all, I was in the gym training and the bobsled at the winter Olympics came on the TV 
And one of the guys that was looking after me in the gym down at the New South Wales Institute of Sport in Sydney, Jolt Zumba, he competed for Hungary in bobsled at two Olympic Games. And he'd helped with the Australian bobsled team as well. So just the TV was on, the bobsled was on. And I said to him like, oh, do you reckon if I trained full time for it, I could make the Australian team? And he kind of looked at me like, oh, and he knows me. He like, he's seen me over my career. His, his wife's been heavily involved in athletics coaching. And so is he. So um, we knew each other really well from the track. And he said, oh, yeah, actually, I think so. And I was like, oh, immediately in my head as he walked away, I was like, I really want to do it now. And so I kind of spent the next week or two in my own mind without telling anybody, just going over it, like how it would work, how much they could lift, how, how fast they could run. And I was, I was faster than most of the boys, obviously, um, coming from athletics. Uh, there was only one boy that could beat me because uh, he, he came from athletics as well. And then I was pretty close to what they were lifting <clears throat> in the gym. And I knew that obviously if I put more effort into the lifting, then I would probably catch up reasonably fast because in athletics, you want to be kind of small and strong, you know, light and strong. And in bobsled, it's, it's better to be heavy and strong. So it's easier to, to lift a little bit more when you're a bit heavier. And then for an example, this year, when I was sliding, I was 93 kilos. And at the moment, I'm only 85 kilos. And my general training weight for athletics would be about 88 kilos. And uh, racing weight would be 84. Yeah, so the weight is, is a big change in, this, in the thing. And then I was, at, I was in the office and we went for a walk with my dad. He said, like, let's go for lunch. We were halfway up the street and he said, like, so what are you going to do? So are you enjoying, are you enjoying the office? And I was like, no, not really. And he's like, yeah, I know. That's why I asked. And I said, yeah, and yes. He said, what are you going to do after Com games? Like, you're going to have to do this full time. And I was like, uh, I kind of had this thought that I could try bobsled, but I'd have to move to Europe to be able to do it because the seasons don't work properly. And he said, like within 30 seconds, he just said, yeah, go try it. And I was like, oh my God, now someone's told me I could possibly do it. Someone else has told me maybe I should try it. Uh, the next conversation I had was with my wife and I was like, this is not going to get across the line. Like we've just got a, we've got an eight week old daughter. This is like never, never going to get across the line kind of thing. And, uh, uh, at the time, actually, she, my daughter wasn't born because she was born. Oh, she would have been just born at that time because I, she was born eight weeks before Com Games. Right. And uh, and I spoke to my wife and I said, yeah, I kind of want to try bobsled. And she looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, like, but to do it, we'd have to move to Europe so we could move to closer to your family. And she was just like, yeah, OK, let's go. So you train, so just to clarify a couple of things here. So this is obviously the Olympic bobsled team for Australia. You're training in the Czech Republic, I guess, by yourself up to a point until you, yep. you know the crew comes together and then you'll train at the various winter venues t together, I assume. Yeah, so the, so the ultimate goal is to go to the Olympics. Like mm -hmm. That's not easy. And I'm not saying I'm going to. I really want to, mm -hmm. but it's going to be really difficult. Uh, and where does Tokyo fit into this grand plan? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to Tokyo. <laughs> I want to be the first Paralympian uh, to go to the Olympics, to then, like, first Paralympian to be a Paralympian, turn around, go to the Olympics in a different sport to what they did at the Paralympics. And it'll be the first Paralympian also to go summer Paralympics, winter Olympics, the double switch. And by the time Tokyo comes around, obviously, particularly now with the year postponement, so let's just say, you know, what, August, August, September 2021, you would obviously know by that point, would you, if you were in the bobsleigh team then for 2022? Uh, so I think they would announce the shadow team, which is basically at the end of this season, which is going to be very interesting to see what happens this season. It's supposed to start in you know, September, October. 
and the season runs in America and in Europe. So it's almost impossible to with the logistics of, especially if they still have a two week ban, a uh, two week isolation when you go to a different country, because often in bobsled, we go like Norway, Germany, France, Latvia, Germany, like we move around and that's week to week. It's impossible. You need three weeks gap between each race so that people could, could theoretically still do it. Um, so we'll see what happens with that se- with the season. But at the end of this season, they would name a shadow squad, which is um, basically a larger squad of everyone who's met the requirements so far. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we would do the next season up until so the the games would be in February March I think it is and uh, January 16th is the cutoff day and they calculate your points that you've that you've won during that season mm-hmm. and in the two man the top 17 countries uh, top 18 countries will go in the two man and the top 17 countries go in the four man so I hope you've got a film crew lined up for this to follow your <laughs> great stories. Uh, um, I don't think they need to see what goes on behind the scenes in bobsled. It's absolute cowboy stuff. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's genuinely a brilliant uh, ambition. I'm pleased to hear we'll see you uh, in Tokyo. And then um, I really hope we see you in Beijing as well, but perhaps not maybe as we expected we might. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. It would be really nice if I did make the Beijing Olympics because that, the Beijing is where I debuted at the Paralympics as well. So. Um, and I know from my lecturer in landscape architecture, he was uh, lecturing in, in Australia, in Canberra, where I was um, learning. And he was also lecturing in Beijing as a guest lecturer often. And they did an, they did an excursion to the Olympic Park. And he was able to walk up to the wall of the medalists and point out and say, oh, that's, that's my student in Australia. So it would be pretty cool to go back to Beijing. Fantastic. I'm writing all this down. I'm going to start working on the screenplay for this now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of which are straight. Hugh Jackman is already lined up for the... Uh, for this <laughs> no, no. I think he's uh, a bit too, bit too ripped for me. I don't think I could keep up with Wolverine. <laughs> well, listen, it's really interesting, genuinely. And uh, good, good luck with it all. And uh, Thank thanks, for, thanks for chatting to me today. No problem. Easy. Take care, Evan. Thanks very much. See ya.